Boozy, juicy, and fruity. Time to brew an IPA. Welcome back, brewers and beer lovers, to Flying Wombat TV, the channel where it's all about making really fun and exciting styles of beer with science and biotech involved. So, today we're back for another brew day. Uh, last time we brewed that chocolate stout. Time to come way back around and go more to the fruity side of things. So, we're gonna brew a Nipah. It's personally one of my favorite styles of beer. Heaps of people get into drinking craft beer with Nipahs, so figured it's about time, we may as well brew one ourselves. So come along for the ride. We are gonna release this recipe through to you guys and talk you through the whole process. So sit back, enjoy, and brew on guys. Super quick run through on the ingredients we're gonna be using today. I'll explain what they all do and why we're using each of them as we go throughout the video. But to keep it short and sweet for you guys for now, 7.7 .7 kilos of pale ale malt, regular two row barley, that in imperial units. Uh, 1.65 kilos of wheat malt. 1.1 kilos of rolled oats, uh, and 550 grams of uh, crisp caragol, which is just like a really light caramel, really light crystallized malt. We're gonna use 550 grams of rice hulls, that's just to help with our sparging and our loudering. And then as far as hops go, 10 grams of uh, galaxy at the start of the boil, 40 grams each of Sabro, um, Sabro, Amarillo, Mosaic, and El Dorado. Not your regular hops though, these are Lupo Max hops, and I'll explain what they are in a little bit. Lastly, we're gonna be using SP Kavaik Yeast from Omega Yeasts. Let's get to it. Okay, so a uh, quick note to point out here, the oats are not going in the grain mill, they don't get crushed because these guys are steamrolled, so they've basically already been, you know, crushed. And if you crush these even more, it could cause two problems. One, it could make your grain mill get really stuck, and you know, that's a big pain to try and get all the grains out. Two, if you crush these up before putting them in the water, um, it could really make a bit of a goopy porridge. So you don't wanna crush these any more than what they've already been rolled to. Same as the rice hulls, these aren't getting crushed either. These get added in with all your grains after they've been milled, because these things act like tiny little springs inside all the grains, so they kind of move all the grains a little bit further apart so that when you're sparging and when you're you know mashing all the water can just flow through all your grains a little bit easier so especially when you're working with things with really high protein content like oats and wheat and stuff they get really gloopy and it can make a stuck sparge so just using a bit of rice hulls can make your life just a little bit easier on brew day uh, all right now time for some grain milling so as always we're setting our grain mill to a 1.1 millimeter gap uh, but every grain mill is different, use what works for you. That's a happy medium sweet spot, generally speaking, to give a good medium crush, not too fine, not too coarse. So, away we go. Okay, so, Apologies for the noise, but we're gonna power through it. Talking about the grains, um, you know, the barley, the two row pale ale malt, that's just giving the base of our flavor, the sweetness, the sugar, it's gonna turn into booze. Um, the reason we're using so much wheat and oat is because that's how you get that silkiness, that smoothness, the creamy uh, mouthfeel with a Nipah. So you need that, that creamy mouthfeel to balance all the massive amount of hops you're gonna be using. If you didn't have that, it just feel very lopsided and it just, it won't feel very balanced, I guess, when you're drinking. So the oats and the wheat really give that creamy silkiness and that head retention to the beer. Um, then the, the crisp Caragold, uh, you know, that's just a very light crystallized malt. So it's enough to add sweetness, more like a toffee sweetness rather than a caramel sweetness, which is, I think, something that works a little bit better in a really fruity, boozy style of beer. Kind of want more of that toffee sweetness rather than thick caramel, because we don't want this uh, to be a very... I don't know, we don't want it to have a very thick feeling mouthfeel. We want it to carry that sweetness, but a lighter sweetness, which I think more, marries more to the toffee side rather than the caramel side. But look, that could just be me talking shit. So take all of this with a grain of salt, to be honest. Okay, so now we can just mix our oats back in with the rest of the grains now that they've already been crushed, as well as our rice hulls. All of these can go back in. 
We'll give this whole thing a nice big mix up with the mash paddle while it's still dry. And then it's all, you know, nice and evenly distributed when it goes into the mash tun. Let's grab a handful. It smells mm -hmm. nice. It smells really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, time to mash in. So we're going to put our uh, malt pipe into our mash tun. Forgot to take the uh, the extension off. <laughs> take two. All right. Time to mash in. Uh, so we're going to put the malt pipe into our mash tun, and we can start throwing our grains in. There we go. Okay, so, uh, sit rep on the water. We're gonna use 30 liters in our uh, strike water, in our mashing, and then we're gonna use 30 liters as sparge water. So, we should end up at the end of all of this with a six and a half-ish percent beer off the top of my head. I don't know, we'll figure out how we go. Time to mash in. Once again, as always, set your strike temperature a couple degrees higher than what you're actually um, going to be mashing at because as you throw the grains into the water, the water cools down a little bit. So just to save you a bit of time heating that water back up, set your strike temperature a little bit higher. And once again, good practice is to add a little bit of grain, give it a big mix up, add a little bit more grain, give it a bit of a mix up, so on and so forth. That way you prevent dough balls and it just makes it easier to mix everything up properly. So we finished uh, mixing up and mashing all of our grains. Time to put our top filter on, let the whirlpool, or uh, well, the recirculation start, and then, you know, mash for, I think this one's an hour at 69 degrees. So we'll see you after that. So just to show you guys quickly what we're talking about with recirculation, we've got our top filter on now. We have a pump attached to our brewing system. So now we can start recirculating the liquid over the whole grain bed. So when we turn this pump on, this is just going to start filling up over the top. Any of the overflow will go down the overflow pipe. But the idea is that all of this liquid keeps recirculating, helps keep a steady temperature, and it helps give you maximum extraction out of the grains. All right, we'll see you in an hour. So it's now been an hour and we have finished mashing. It's time to start loudering or you know, sparging. Basically means we're going to run water from our hot liquor tank at 78 degrees Celsius, that in Imperial units, over the top of our grain bed. So the whole purpose of that is to extract any extra sugars that are still trapped in the grains, whilst also denaturing all of the enzymes that are currently breaking down those complex sugars. So run that hot water over top of it, and then it's kind of like uh, just getting a little bit more bang for your buck when it comes to getting extra sugar out of your grains. So we're gonna turn our pump on now, and let this water start recirculating over top of the grain bed. So I'll move this so you can see it. So as the water flows, it's eventually going to start rising up above this uh, top filter here. And then this is called uh, fly sparging. So we're basically just going to keep a steady flow of water coming over top of the grains. That's going to keep going down through the grains, dragging all those extra sugars down with it. Whilst this is going on, we're going to get this thing up to boiling temperature and then we can start throwing in our hops and uh, get to boiling. Okay, so once this is finishing, we're going to get to boiling and we can start throwing in our hops. Okay, so we're now at boiling temperature, time to throw in our hops. 10 grams of Galaxy into the boiler, and, oh, you wanna get it? There we go. Away we go, clock is on. So, we're gonna do this for one hour. At the 45 minute mark, we're going to uh, throw in our Wellflock tablets. So with 15 minutes left to go on the boil, that's just gonna help clarify everything just a little bit to prevent the glugginess and all the hazy proteins. And then we're gonna go flame out at the one hour mark, bring this down to a uh, whirlpool temperature. So start circulating the wort, 75 degrees Celsius, and then we'll throw in all of our whirlpool hops for 20 minutes. See you then. Okay, so now we've got 15 minutes left in the boil. Throw in your whirlflock tablets. Ready? Bloop. 
Um, and uh, yeah, at 15 minutes, flame out, start whirlpooling, and then once we drop the temperature to 75 degrees, we'll throw in our whirlpool hocks. Okay, it's been 15 more minutes. We're now at the end of our boil, so it's flame out time. Turn off your power or your flames or whatever you're using to heat up your boiler. Uh, and start your whirlpool. So bring it down to 75 degrees, whirlpooling it while you do so, and then uh, once it reaches 75, we'll throw all of our whirl hop, uh, our whirlpool hops in there. So, whirl hops. There you go. Whirl hops. Whirl hops. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have the ability to whirlpool, uh, you can do it with like a paint mixer, like, um, like something like this. Could use one of these to get a, a bit of a whirlpool going with a power drill, something like that. If not, don't stress, throw your hops in once it cools down a bit anyway. Alrighty, let's turn this on. Oh yeah, and if you haven't seen our previous video, what we're using here is a counterflow chiller. So you don't need to use one of these. Uh, if you're using an old school, you know, immersion chiller, like the one on the back wall up there, that's totally fine as well. If you're using an ice bucket, doesn't matter. Whatever means you have to cool your thing down, start cooling it down now, bring it down to 75 degrees. But the principle of this thing is essentially that beer flows inside an inner tube, inside this coil. On the outer coil, there's uh, cold water flowing around it. So, yeah, counterflow. All right, let's get our whirlpool going. Nice. Sick. Now we're at 75 degrees, so time to add our whirl hop. Whirl hop, <laughs> bloody hell. Whirlpool hops. Anyway, I'm gonna throw them into the hop spider. Uh, again, this hop, uh, mesh thing here is called a hop spider. It just helps separate your hops from the rest of the liquid. You don't need one. If you have one, use it. Anyway, hops away. Now we're gonna leave this in here whirlpooling for 20 minutes. At the end of 20 minutes, we can actually do flame out, bring it down to yeast pitching temperature and throw it into the tank. One other thing you can do is uh, put the lid on while you're whirlpooling. The reason for that is because the whole purpose behind throwing in your hops during the whirlpool is to try and maximize the amount of hot oils that you're retaining inside the liquid, inside the wort. One way of doing that is by trying to prevent vapor escaping. Never leave the lid on while you're boiling. You want that vapor to escape, but once you're whirlpooling, uh, you can try and trap in those flavors and aromas once you throw those hops in. So if you can, just like put your lid on or whatever to try and prevent all the steam from just escaping and carrying all that flavor away with it. Uh, now while we're on the topic of hops, I mentioned before that we were using Lupomax hops. So these are basically, uh, you know, chemically or biochemically engineered hops to carry way more hop oil and alpha acids than a standard hop. And the other advantage of it is that not only is it carrying way more, it's also carrying a very um, set amount. So you have repeatability and reliability when you're trying to make repeat batches, it always has the same amount of hop oil, it always has the exact same alpha acid because it's been engineered to be that way. So um, the big benefit of using things like Lupo Max hops or Cryo hops or anything like that is when you're making really hop heavy beers, you can reduce your actual hop load. So you can use say 30% less hops or 40% less hops than you would normally use to get the same amount of flavor. So when you're trying to do those really hop heavy beers, that's got two benefits. One, you're gonna lose less liquid, because for example, when you dry hop, when you throw hops in here, the hops soak up a lot of liquid and you just lose beer. Two, you're gonna get way less vegetal or like leafy, grassy flavors, because with over hopping, you run the risk of getting those weird like vegetable grass flavors coming through, and that's just because of the vegetal matter, the amount of hops that are in there. So if you can use less hops, but get the same flavor profile, everyone's winning. How'd the yeast go, mate? They're alive. They're alive. They're alive. Yeah, you wanna come and look at the yeast while we wait for this? Yeah, yeah. Got like 30 seconds. So yeah, that starter we did, even though with a liquid um, yeast slurry, you don't need to do a starter. It's still good to do a starter, if you, a starter if you really want that yeast to be active, like straight out of the gates. So if you've got the ability to do it, always do it. It just makes your yeast healthier, more active. You get to create more yeast and multiply them before you dump them into the tank. So you got more to work with. There's, there's only benefits, really. May as well do it. All right, so we've finished uh, our boiling, we've finished our whirl hop additions, whoops. Uh, and we're now at yeast pitching temperature. So we're gonna start transferring all the stuff from our boiler into our fermenter tank. And then from there, we can pitch the yeast and let those guys start doing their thing. So let's take this off and open the top up.
There we go. Uh, so however, you guys are going to do it. Start transferring now. Put it all into your tank. We have the benefit of being able to use a pump, so we're doing that. Um, but if you're just going to pour it in, put it into a bucket fermenter, into a different version, whatever you're using, transfer now. Once all your stuff is in there, pitch your yeast. We'll see you then. All right, we have now basically finished transferring everything in, so we're going to throw our yeasty boys in. Away they go to do their thing. So this particular strain that we're using was, um, was it Ester? Estate? Pause. <laughs> and just hold the camera, hold the camera there. Espe. <laughs> Espe. That particular strain was Espe Kavaiak yeast, which is supposed to produce really fruity, lychee, tropical fruit cup flavors. So I reckon that's going to work perfectly with this particular Nipah that we're brewing here. Um, and yeah, we'll see how it goes. So this should take about a week and a half, I'm guessing, until it's finished fermenting and ready to go into the keg. Uh, obviously, times will vary for you guys, but the next time that we see you will be when we're dry hopping this bad boy. So, I guess we'll catch you then. Alrighty guys, it's now been 11 days uh, since we put all this stuff into the tank. So, it's ready for dry hopping. Now, normally it shouldn't take this long with something like a kabai yeast, but I made a little bit of a boo-boo when on the, on the brew day. I accidentally cooked the yeast inside the yeast starter. I let the temperature get way too hot on the stir plate and I probably lost a lot of healthy yeast cells. So that's why this one took a little bit long to get around to it. But word of advice, don't cook your yeast. So anyway, it made it, it's finished, uh, almost finished fermenting. So it's down to 1.017. Um, so I'm gonna throw all of my hops in there. I'm expecting this thing to get to about 1.012. So dry hop today. I'm gonna let it sit there for one day and then I'm gonna start cold crashing. By that point, we should be at final gravity and uh, we can start cleaning this beer up for kegging. So, we have our hops over here. Uh, once again, in here we have 65 grams each, that in, you know, Imperial units of Azakar, Mosaic, Eldorado, and Amarillo. So really fruity, punchy flavors. There's a lot of citrus, there's a lot of stone fruit, there's a lot of um, you know, kind of a watermelon -y candy, really sweet flavors going on. So that squirted in my eye. That should be really nice in a uh, in an EPA. So once again, uh, we're using the dry hopper here. So you don't need one of these things, but what this basically does is it allows us to do zero oxygen dry hopping. So we can close off the chamber with this butterfly valve. We can open up the top. We can drop all of our hops into it, uh, purge this thing out with CO2, and then dump it into the tank. If you don't have one of these, just throw your hops straight into the uh, into your fermenter. All right. Oh man, I don't want to lose any of these. There we go. Whoops. Oh, kidoki. All right, so hops are in. Close this off again, and then we're gonna let these guys fly into the tank. All right, so now I just attach my um, gas connect so I can purge this whole thing with a little bit of CO2. Do this a couple times. And we're probably about good to go. All right. Ready for your close up? Yeah. Hops away. <laughs> All right, so that's that. Um, we're gonna let this sit, as I said, we're gonna let it sit at the same temperature it's fermenting at, so in this case, 32 degrees Celsius for one more day. At that point, I'll take a gravity reading, make sure we're at final gravity. Once I'm happy with that, start cold crashing. So if you don't have the ability to cold crash, don't worry about it, don't stress, start bottling up. If you can, if you have like a fridge or something that you're putting your fermenter in, start cold crashing after this has been in there for one day. And then, you know, gradually, you know, do your hop dumps after that second day. So one day at same temperature, one day at cold crash temperature, start taking all the trub out of the tank if you have the ability to do that. If not, after it's cold crash for a couple days, it's time to keg slash bottle slash can, whatever you're doing. So uh, that's that. We've gone through the full process on our Kavaik Nipa um, brew day. I've taken you through, you know, mashing, boiling, you know, hopping, dry hopping, all that kind of stuff. 
Next time you see us will be in a week. We are gonna have this kegged and ready, and we'll see you guys at the round table for a little bit of a tasting. So, uh, as always, uh, if you're feeling generous, like, subscribe, do all the YouTube-y things, and cheers for watching. Brilliant, guys.